Welcome to the uh, first David Bradford Energy and Environmental Policy Seminar for this year. Our guest today is David Hayes, a lecturer in law at Stanford and senior fellow at the Natural Resources Defense Council. David has a long and distinguished career in government. He's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and Stanford Law School. Until about a year ago, he served as special assistant to President Biden for climate policy. He served earlier as Deputy Secretary and Chief Op Operating Officer at the U.S. Department of Interior under both Presidents Clinton and Obama. Between his periods of government service, David was Executive Director of the State Energy and Environmental Impact Center at NYU Law School, held lectureships at Stanford, and was a partner and global chair of the Environment, Land, and Natural and Resources Department at Latham and Watkins Law Firm. Somehow, he also found time to uh, serve as chair of, chairman of the board of uh, the Environmental Law Institute. About two years ago, when I began to focus more attention, not just on research on climate risk, but on improving implementation of adaptation policy, I asked a knowledgeable friend who would be the right person to connect with at the White House about this, and he made a few calls and he said it was David, and that was right on. Among the dozens of conversations I've had since then with administration officials in the various departments and agencies about how the federal government currently handles adaptation and where it could do better, uh, that one stands out for its depth clarity and honesty. Uh, David's topic today is partnering with nature and technology to address climate challenges. Please join me in welcoming David Hayes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here. Um, I'm not going to ask if you're here for the lunch or for the lecture, uh, but please enjoy the lunch, and I hope you like the lecture as well. Um, so you're at a great school here, and many of you are making big contributions in the climate area. And um, I'm excited that you're here today to hear what I have to say. And I just want to uh, know how lucky you are to have people like Michael around, and Jesse Jenkins, and so many others uh, here at, at Princeton. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a proposition for you, uh, which is a little bit different than the title that uh, was circulated before. Um, I'm going to say that nature and technology must join forces to address the climate crisis. Um, and I start with an observation from my personal experience, uh, but I think it's broadly applicable, which is that tech the technology and the nature side of the climate uh, equation really are in two different worlds. They coexist, but they are different worlds. There are really two lanes here, because, and this is not new. There's a long time divide between technology and nature that we've seen in broader environmental policy for literally decades. And I've seen this in my own career, uh, uh, having spent considerable time in both lanes. Uh, when I first uh, got introduced to environmental policy, um, it was uh, in the EPA world. And the EPA world, as an environmental lawyer, you are enmeshed in technology. Uh, technology is king when it comes to EPA. Uh, historically, and even now, EPA is most comfortable when it's pushing the latest and best available technology. It's a standard setting organization with standards based on leading edge technologies that can clean up pollution and air, water, hazardous waste, uh, et cetera. Um, and today, now, that pollution includes the greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. Um, now, for years, EPA had essentially a research arm called the Department of Energy uh, to do some basic research. Um, but uh, now that uh, energy technology is central to climate, um, uh, uh, e DOE has matured and uh, arguably an equal partner with EPA uh, when it comes to technology. And then we have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, a regula regulatory agency dealing with energy issues that for many decades was the backwater, um, now also coming to the fore because of 
its involvement in the energy technology and its application uh, and, and the regulatory implications of it. But I learned about this other environmental lane, um, land, water, resources, when I joined the Interior Department uh, in a long time ago in the Clinton administration, um, where and the Department of the Interior, together with its counterpart, uh, the Forest Service and the Department of Agriculture, together manage one third of the land mass of the entire United States. The largest landowner in the United States is the Bureau of Land Management. 10% of, of, of lands are, are managed by, by BLM. Um, and both of these departments also have authorities and funding that impact the management of virtually all lands and offshore waters in the US. The lands and waters that are our national treasures, uh, lands and waters that host agriculture, forestry, extractive industry, and wildlife alike, lands and waters that we hold in trust for American Indians and Alaska Natives. And in this complex world of landscapes and watersheds, we don't have national standards typically. Place-based land, water, wildlife, economic and cultural resource conflicts are not uncommon, and they have to be resolved in connection with the place and the people, not technology driven. Um, so this creates um, some, uh, so, so I'll show you a slide that, that illustrates what I'm talking about here, the, the, the different cultures and approaches. So on the technology side, you've got industry, right? They're the major client, if you will. On the nature side, you've got conservation, working landscapes, uh, restored landscapes, natural landscapes. Technology, you're attacking pollution. On nature, you're trying to utilize ecosystem services. Technology, it's all about best available technology. For nature, resource management plans. How do we work these resources together? Technology, parts per million, parts per billion, tell us what you're going to get in terms of pollution. For nature, sustainable development. For technology, it's NRDC and EDF. For nature, it's the Nature Conservancy and the uh, National Wildlife Federation. The advocates are different. Uh, for technology, it's, and here in climate, it's clean energy technology solutions. For nature, it's nature-based climate solutions. So, now don't get me wrong. These two worlds are not complete strangers by, by any means. Um, for one uh, measure, technology failures sometimes bring them together. Uh, I was the first administration official down in the Gulf of Mexico the morning after the Deepwater Horizon blew up. That was uh, regular, uh, as the Deputy Secretary of Interior, where the regulators, technology let us down. I'm still scarred by that experience, I will tell you, because there was a fail-safe blowout preventer that was always going to work and never provide <laughs> a problem for, the, for, for nature. And, now, and then we've had new chemicals, uh, technologically based exciting chemicals, blow a hole in the ozone layer in, uh, above us. And then later the, 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 the substitute chemicals, uh, PFAS and, and PFOA, are the forever chemicals that are now uh, contaminating groundwater supplies around the country. But then we have technology that has enormously advanced uh, our environmental interests. Think about the satellites, the Landsat, the availability of Earth observation systems, amazing technology that, that helps us. Um, and climate change is now forcing a marriage between technology and nature. But humans being humans, there's still two tribes here. And I'm, I'm going to suggest that we try to uh, combine forces if we can. Because um, we've got to close this divide. And I, I want to talk a little bit about, about what's happening in each area at a high level, uh, and then come to uh, some areas where there's convergence and, and end with a, a, a plea for technological help on an important nature issue that I think is central to, to climate. Um, so. Why is technology ascendant right now in terms of climate? Well, if you look at the global emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, industry, energy supply, buildings, transport, what are the answers going to come from? They're going to come from technology. They have to. 
right? We need to reduce the emissions uh, from these uh, major uh, sources. It's going to require different things for different areas, but one uh, theme that runs throughout, of course, is we get, have to move from a fossil fuel-based uh, economy to a clean energy economy. That's going to require a lot of new technology and a lot of deployment of new technology. Agriculture, forestry, and land use is not nothing uh, globally. In fact, it's almost a quarter of all emissions. A lot of that is deforestation uh, in the tropics in particular. When you drop down to what's happening in the US, you, you see that the, the nature side has diminished in terms of active uh, emissions because it's, we have less land use conversion. But agriculture uh, in the US and obviously globally, here in the US, 10% of emissions coming from, uh, from uh, the land sector. But again, technology, we need technology on the buildings, on the industry, on electricity, on, on transportation. And, um, and there's a lot happening in this area, and it's very exciting, and it's, uh, it's, it's a big part of the answer to the climate crisis, no doubt, is, is technology. Um, so in particular, we all know that we have to ramp up very aggressively uh, investment and deployment uh, for clean energy technologies. And Jesse knows, and, and those who work with Jesse, you know what those, uh, the, those needs are. I mean, it's like doubling every year, uh, it seems. Transmission, solar, wind, uh, et cetera. Um, also, technology is needed on the regulatory side. Um, the, the first three years of the Biden administration have been largely focused on uh, financing of, uh, of new uh, clean energy incentives, which I'll talk about in a minute. We're now moving to the regulatory side, where EPA and technology, again, are king. So for the power industry, we're looking at carbon capture and storage as potentially the benchmark for deciding what uh, certainly new sources must meet and maybe even existing sources. For transportation, it's all about electric vehicles, amazing transformation, and the supply chains that are associated with them. Uh, for the oil and gas industry, it's been new technology that's enabled us to see what a problem uh, uh, leaks are throughout the oil and gas sector, uh, and we're going to have to ratchet down on those. And then there's all the research and development going on in, the, uh, in this area, which is remarkable. The, uh, I was shocked myself when I looked at the DOE website uh, on Earth shots. This is their, their idea of marketing, I guess. I don't know. I think they could do better than Earth shot. Uh, it's like, <laughs> OK, we're going to, really? Um, <laughs> but they have, they have goals. They have a hydrogen shot. They have a long duration storage shot. They have a carbon negative shot. Can you, you know, don't see, this is, this is another problem with technologists, OK? Uh, enhanced geothermal shot, floating offshore wind shot, industrial heat shot, clean fuels and products shot. OK, that's a lot of shots. Uh, uh, and, he, and it, this is why it, um, I want, I'm not going to say anything bad about DOE. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> never mind. Um, but this is this is this is this is the uh, this is saddle days for technology. We need all of these things in order to change our economy. And the amazing thing about the Biden administration that I had the pleasure to and the honor to be involved in is what what's happened with the legislation that has has gone into effect now to, again, illustrate the uh, level of intensity of this technology effort. So the bipartisan infrastructure law, which people tend to ignore in, a term, in terms of climate, uh, had $65 billion in it for grid reliability and resilience. That's a little bit of an overstatement, uh, but that's what people say. <laughs> uh, uh, but they had new authority and, and important money to deal with, with uh, the transmission issues. And they also, uh, but many billions for key new technologies like carbon capture and storage, like hydrogen, like direct air capture and energy efficiency, lots of money. And then the Inflation Reduction Act is the home run that occurred a year ago, uh, where the tax credits, which are anticipated to probably uh, involve at least over a trillion dollars of federal spending, estimated the whole climate estimate was 369 billion. <laughs> 
but tax credits have no cap on them. And industry is lapping them up because they know this is the future. So industries are getting uh, huge tax credits, typically 30% or more, uh, on clean energy production and investments. That's everything from uh, more deployment of solar and wind, uh, et cetera, uh, to uh, uh, also uh, advanced energy project and manufacturing production tax credits, so the conversion of existing manufacturing facilities into uh, new facilities for new products like EVs and batteries, et cetera, all huge tax credits, clean vehicle tax credits that you and I can take advantage of, uh, also consumer and business tax credits on energy efficiency, amazing, amazing. This is money that is, is, is right in line with what many companies know the future is anyway, and it's, it's really powering it forward. So thank you, technology. And also $40 billion ex, uh, expansion of the DOE loan programs office, which is all about bringing new technologies to market and $27 billion in the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is a fantastic uh, green bank concept of revolving financing to help, in particular, uh, uh, programs in urban areas and for, for less advantaged uh, folks who can't put solar on their rooftop or whatever. Find ways for uh, financing clean energy, energy efficiency, uh, and other climate benefits for those uh, communities. That's rolling out, starting to roll out right now. So, so look, given all of this, it's no wonder that many technologists think, hey, this is the ball game. Nature, we don't, what, what difference about nature? We don't necessarily care about nature. Um, well, we do, and I think there are three reasons why nature has a big role here. Uh, first is the fact that the greenhouse gas emissions are substantial. Uh, the, certainly globally, the deforestation issue and the integrity of the sinks that are uh, capturing and storing huge volumes of uh, both natural and anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gases, uh, that's, that's a huge uh, issue. And then agriculture. And, and agriculture is particularly important um, because the greenhouse gas uh, greenhouse gases we're worried about for agriculture are largely methane and nitrous oxides. Yes, carbon too, and, and there are some agricultural practices that can help keep more carbon in the soils and potentially over time build up some more carbon in the soils. But, but actually when it comes to carbon in agriculture, those practices are mainly intended to help reduce the loss of carbon. Uh, then actually accumulate large, large volumes. But methane, methane is all about cows and livestock, right? So, um, and methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than, uh, than, than uh, carbon dioxide. And nitrous oxide associated with fertilizers put on soils is 300 times more powerful than, uh, than, than carbon dioxide as a, as a greenhouse gas. And, uh, and nitrous oxide is, uh, let's see, I think it's 11% of, of, uh, of emissions in the US. Maybe, maybe that's a little high. Uh, but in any event, we know that methane, uh, here, let me start with methane. We all know, we all know, most of you know, about methane and oil and gas. That's what we hear about, right? The leaking of the methane, uh, and, and it's a powerful greenhouse gas. It's the largest industrial source of methane in the United States, responsible for 32% of US methane emissions, uh, almost a third of the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are because of methane right now. They're shorter lived, but they're causing the most damage right now as, in the period when we most need to reduce these emissions, that the, the, the current problem, because we're going to solve it long term. But guess what? More methane is coming from US agriculture than from the oil and gas industry. So it's a serious problem. It's only now really starting to be addressed. Similarly, um, nitrous oxides, oh, it's 6% of overall US emissions. Um, but agriculture is responsible for 80% 
of, those, of that 6%. This, these are not small numbers. So that's one reason uh, why uh, we have to care about um, nature. Uh, the second reason uh, is that nature is really helping right now mitigate greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas problem. Um, and let me give you some stats. And, and these are from Chris Field at Stanford. Uh, Michael and I were just talking about Chris, who worked on the IPCC, one of the several IPCC reports with, with Michael. So here are some basic uh, give, uh, takeaways. Photosynthesis is obviously a powerful engine for uh, carbon dioxide removal. And on the land and in the ocean, photosynthesis converts over 700 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year into organic matter. That's 15 times the total released from anthropogenic activities. So photosynthesis is the big, big carbon flux. Um, and then we've got a much smaller amount of anthropogenic uh, emissions that are going up. And before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, this photosynthesis uh, release and capture was basically uh, roughly balanced. Uh, in, in recent years, though, um, the uh, uh, ecosystems on lands and the oceans have, have performed as, as, as carbon sinks that are taking more than they ever have been in and reducing, as a result, the current impact of greenhouse gases. Now, it's harming. It's harming the oceans. We know that. But it, it's actually responsible now for, it's, it's, it's working overtime. These, these natural sinks are taking in 40% of the annual anthropogenic uh, increases, uh, uh, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So it's working overtime already. And given the fact that it's such a powerful concept, photosynthesis, it has the potential to do more if we're smart about it. Um, so there's the, that's where this, there's this significant opportunity for nature-based climate solutions. It's like more forests in urban areas, everywhere. Now, you got to be smart about this. And, and, and it, this can be overstated very quickly. But there's, there's, there, there's Mother Nature wants to help us and is willing to help us if we can figure out how to preserve our current sinks and actually increase the productivity of our sinks. So, um, and Chris Woods, uh, Chris Field at Woods has suggested that, and others suggested that, doing things we know how to do could potentially bring us as much as 10 gigatons per year of additional sequestration of carbon from the atmosphere. But a lot of questions there, a lot of questions there, uh, some of which I'm going to get into, measurement in particular and monitoring. But also, you can go overboard here, right? You know, uh, there's going to be competition for land. Uh, we need land for food. Uh, some folks want land for energy. Uh, and and one, one of the ways to potentially do this would actually be uh, to uh, raise plants that, that, and then uh, take the carbon out and bury it, vex, basically. Well, that's, that's more pressure on limited lands as well. So this is it's not a panacea, but it's an important part of the equation that we need to take advantage of, both because there's a negative if we don't, losing sinks, and there's a potential positive as well. I'll say one other thing. And this I'm putting in my old Interior Department hat on. People love landscapes. And, and the lands. And, and, and climate change is a really awkward and sort of abstract thing. Um, it makes people feel good to know that protecting important landscapes um, is, is helping the carbon cycle. And, and planting the new forests that are going into uh, places like Phoenix uh, and Seattle and, and other cities because of extreme heat uh, among other things, and the many other advantages that come with trees, I mean, that, that, that can make you feel good, too. And it, 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 so, so there's that piece of it as well. So um, 
again, this can be overstated, but uh, oh, there, yeah, I had the three of things right there. I was searching for them. OK, uh, it's a na major source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's, it's a potential driver of greenhouse gas removals. That's what I'm talking about here, which is a better conversation to have than avoided deforestation for about a 1,000 reasons that I can get into in Q&A. But, but, but uh, nature does remove greenhouse gases through photosynthesis. And, and there are opportunities there. And then there's a big role of nature in climate impacts and resilience that I want to talk about first. So, but, but uh, in a minute. OK. So but nature can do more. Forests, agricultural lands, wetlands, peatlands, blue carbon, you know, the kelp forests potentially, right? You're going to have a kelp cocktail later, maybe, <laughs> in your life. Uh, uh, and it's all, about, it's all about being creative about our landscapes and seascapes and seeing what they can do to help with climate. That if we can figure out some good ways of doing it, we've got scale. We've got scale. And at relatively low cost, and this is also, I'll, I'll put this with an asterisk out uh, uh, with it, but um, uh, the, uh, uh, hold that thought for a minute. OK, and then there are many co-benefits associated with nature, uh, again, if it's done right. right? So um, those, those urban forests are not only helping with uh, extreme heat, uh, they're, they're, they're putting shade on buildings that enable them to use less energy. Uh, they are helping some cities with their water management issues. Lots of co-benefits for agriculture. Um, the uh, cover crops that can help keep the carbon in the soil also help prevent, prevent erosion. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, lots of co-benefits. But the low cost is, comes from um, a study that the Nature Conservancy did some years ago, which um, which I think is overstated, but uh, but you know these are some mitigation uh, some mitigation potentially uh, 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 mitigation options that are available for forestry like reforestation after there's a fire and or uh, also afforestation where the areas that haven't been forest for decades are planted in forests urban reforestation fire management we're smarter about. Uh, managing our forests so we don't have the catastrophic fires with that throw up so much the carbon dioxide. Anyway, these these are all low-priced options. The the green uh, the sort of penultimate green color is a hundred bucks a ton, which is like cheap compared to what the technologists are giving us, at least in terms of of, of uh, direct air capture and some of the other technologies. So there may be it may be cheap as well. This is also a danger. This, is, this has led a lot of folks in the voluntary carbon markets to say, hey, we can get cheap credits for reducing uh, carbon dioxide through some of these things. And then there's no way to measure it or prove it. And, and uh, you, know the, you know about that. We're, go we're going to get back to that. So then there's the resilience and the, um, the adaptation uh, issues associated with, with nature. Uh, the, we, the, the nature, uh, climate impacts are are literally killing lots of folks here and around the world. Extreme heat is the biggest killer. We've got flooding around the world that's just horrific. A lot of these extreme weather events obviously are, associate, are, are uh, uh, influenced by climate change. Um, and uh, so um, there are associated with many of these hazards potential nature-based solutions that will help reduce the nature of the hazard. These extreme forest fires, for example, are due in part to the buildup of hazardous fuels for many decades as we have uh, insisted on a complete suppression policy in terms of wildfires. Uh, drought, a lot of it is, uh, the, 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 uh, it can be addressed in part by much sounder water management. Good technology, by the way. Uh, and, and, and transferring more, uh, having ag take less and cities take more. So nature-based solutions, um, it's a long list here, but I want to move on. Um, so, so both technology and nature have, have compelling stories to tell here as part of the climate solution. Let's talk about areas where they converge and where the 
the, the fact that we have two different tribes looking at these issues from different points of view can be a bit of a problem. So this is uh, no CMP, Central Main Power Corridor. This is the New England Electric Connect, whatever it was called, right? That, that uh, got uh, turned down, that would, would have brought power in from Hydro-Quebec in Canada down to Massachusetts through Maine. There was a voter uh, proposition. Voters uh, uh, voted it down uh, on nature grounds, if you will. Um, arguably not in my backyard, nature grounds. Um, but this is a big blow. Uh, and uh, now Massachusetts is scrambling. The, the final story has not been told here. There's, there's some work happening in the courts on this. But um, so if the technologists who are just saying, let's string a transmission line through Maine to get that clean energy down to Massachusetts, uh, the, you know, the, good idea. But there's, there are people and nature in the way. Uh, then there are some uh, other technologies, like carbon capture and storage, and BEX, uh, which, is, which I talked about before, where you, you take nature, basically, to, uh, to produce uh, energy, uh, energy crops, et cetera. Uh, then you, but you take the carbon dioxide out and, and store it as you would with a carbon capture and storage. Well. Well, shoot, I mean, you're, you're going to affect, um, there's going to be competition for this nature. Is this how we want to spend, uh, how, do, how we want to utilize uh, a biomass? Uh, and then, uh, you know, there's this geothermal, uh, ge geo, uh, geolo geologic storage thing. I grew up, you know, in, as an environmental lawyer, thinking putting stuff underground is really not a good idea. Uh, you know, we got a chemical the galore down there now, thanks to human activity. Uh, do we really know what's going to happen here? And I don't know. I'm just a little skeptical. Plus, I'm scarred by the, you know, the blowout preventer that that didn't work in the the uh, Deepwater Horizon. Um, and then you've got enhanced rock weathering ideas, which are pretty interesting, but they have to be scaled up in ways. W w in, and do we really know what the effect is going to be on the oceans when you get? Uh, carbonates uh, formed in there. Do we do we know? And are the are the are, is there talk going back and forth? Another area where they converge is in a good way. Um, uh, actually, I want to. Yeah. No. Let's let's move on here. Um, I want to I want to go back just for a minute. Um, a lot of the issues right now are in deployment of clean energy. And there's a lot of talk about permitting, uh, how challenging it is to get permits, to uh, string transmission lines, to site large-scale solar, et cetera. The technologists know it can be done. But if you don't deal with nature and the people who live in the nature and in the communities, it won't happen. And this, this is an example of that. But um, that's where technologists need to learn from folks who understand things like sustainable uh, development and working with communities to get buy-in and, and understanding land conflicts and coming to good resolutions. Um, technology and nature also converge on the climate resilience side. This is an area, resilience.climate.gov. I hope you look at that. If you haven't, there's, um, my blood is, is, is in that website. <laughs> uh, but it's very cool. Uh, it's an example of very cool uh, mapping technology that uh, combined with good science, uh, the, the uh, UN uh, estimates of, of future impacts based on high and lower level emission scenarios on, on what, uh, what San Diego will look like uh, in uh, mid-century in terms of flooding of, of an air base uh, under a, I think this is a um, uh, medium uh, emission scenario. So 
help communities get ready for the climate impacts that are happening. OK. Um, so in my remaining minutes, I want to focus on another area, a specific area, where we need the help of technology to address a big climate issue that's in the nature lane. And when I was in the White House, I helped develop the nationally, our nationally determined contribution goal for 2030. Uh, one of my colleagues, who some of you know well, had the, the harder part, the bigger part, which was modeling uh, on, the, the, on the pollution side, basically. They asked me to look at nature. OK, how much more can we get out of nature by 2030? And so I you know, reached out to my colleagues at, at Interior and USGS, et cetera. And I was reminded at how poor the data are in this area. You cannot really model what, what could, could be uh, because the data are, are so poor. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a problem that has sunk in as much as it has to sink in to folks that we've got to get a better grip on carbon fluxes, methane fluxes, nitrous oxide fluxes associated with specific practices in nature that we think will help combat the climate crisis. And you've got, so you've got the nationally determined contributions. And by the way, for the US, we're not relying on our 50 to 52% uh, reduction by 2030. We're not overly relying on nature for that. We've got technological avenues that are robust and regulatory agencies that, uh, regulatory agencies, uh, avenues that are robust. For many of the countries of the world, all they have is ag and forestry to work with. So their stakes are really high that, that we all collectively figure out what's really happening there. And then you've got companies making net zero commitments, and they can't make it themselves if, uh, uh, or don't want to or aren't willing to pay it or whatever. And if they can get some cheap carbon credits from nature, let's do that instead. That's not good. But, but who knows what, what the data really show? We don't have good metrics there. So you get, you get these carbon market folks who are all in on, on the uh, great idea of a carbon market, uh, and, and, but realize that, gee, we're getting criticized. And they're, they, they're open, they have open letters every week. Uh, but you know, I went to a conference a couple weeks ago in Boulder, Colorado, and they said, we need a new narrative. Yeah, you don't need a new narrative. You need some data. <laughs> yeah. So monitoring, reporting, and verification is what's needed, M MRV. Um, Measurement, monitoring, reporting, MMRV uh, for, for some. So this is not a new idea. And actually, it, that, that NR, the, the exercise of a nationally determined uh, contribution, rather, it, uh, it made us realize in the White House that actually the data are not that good on a lot of greenhouse gases and a lot of applications. I mean, you've got some areas that are great because EPA has, has, has regulated in those areas and looked at those areas. But, um, the, and, and there, there's also a recognition. So the, the um, National Academies uh, prior to uh, Glasgow came up with this report that, uh, that said, hey, you know what? We got a, we got a data problem generally um, on greenhouse gases because decision makers of all kinds uh, at, at the state level, at the subnational level, in the uh, corporate world and community level, want to know what's happening in terms of emissions and reductions because they know how serious it is that we get climate change under control. So they, they emphasized that we have to give more attention to greenhouse gas inventories that quantify emissions or, and removals in, for a specific time and place. They, they, and the stakeholders, including policymakers, scientific communities, businesses, media, non-governmental organizations, general public, all need this information. And not just at the atmospheric level, at the activity level. So if you're going to invest in a new urban forest, what's the baseline? What's the increment of new carbon that's being stored? And for how long? We don't have that information. And the, the National Academy said, 
we should have a coordinated repository or federalization of repositories where greenhouse gas emissions can be hosted, documented, and clear, clearly characterized. So then earlier this year, this special greenhouse gas measurement interagency working group that was the three White House offices, my former office, the Climate Policy Office, Office of OSTP, Science and Technology Policy, uh, and um, OMB, that, that matters actually when they're involved, uh, came up with a federal strategy to advance an integrated US greenhouse gas monitoring and information system. I look at this, they came up with a, a companion about two months ago for, for, carbon, for forestry and agriculture. And they say a lot of really nice things about the need for better data in, the, in this area. Um, so what's, what's happening now? Uh, not enough. Um, on, on we have technology doing great things in terms of measurement and monitoring. Carbon Mapper is a nonprofit that, uh, that, that, that uses satellite data, including a satellite put up by Michael's old outfit, Environmental Defense Fund, to identify major uh, emissions uh, sources. Um, we have a global methane pledge. Methane is on everyone's front burner. So where's the data? And the oil and gas industry is going to be regulated when a final rule is going to come out in a month or two by the end of this year. Where's all the data about emissions from the oil and gas industry, from the agricultural industry, whatever? Where is it going to go? Who knows? Who knows? There's no repository for it. There's no plan for it. Um, the US Forest Service has a, a FIA database, Federal Inventory and Analysis Database, which they're very proud of. They've had it for 30 years or so, or maybe 40 years, where they have field plots all over the country on a regional basis that show how much so, uh, carbon is being absorbed uh, in soils and in trees, uh, among other things. Um, C Trees is a nonprofit that has taken this database and with the help of remote sensing from publicly available satellite data and, uh, 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 and uh, machine learning, they can figure out in much more precision how much carbon is actually in a tree stand uh, in uh, New York City uh, or, uh, in the, uh, uh, or anywhere on the globe, actually. Forest Service doesn't use remote sensing or machine learning. Uh, they're very proud of this. Then we have the ag, ag sector, where the USDA has invested on, in models that weren't intended to measure for carbon, that only provide a positive result for carbon, and that weren't calibrated uh, in a very sophisticated way at all. And this is what they're counting on for agricultural uh, measurement and monitoring. Meanwhile, Crosswalk Labs, Look at this site. This is a very cool site. This is a philanthropic uh, supported site where uh, CO2, which is much better characterized, you know, uh, CO2 from plants, et cetera, uh, as in power plants, uh, is, is downscaled to the local level. And a, a mayor can see uh, where the emission sources are, whether they're going down over time, et cetera. So we have technology. And then we have agencies with their, their feet in the mud. Uh, and we have a problem. Um, what we need is a data commons for greenhouse gas data across the way, across the, uh, the whole scope, um, where data that's being invested in by the federal government on methane, on forestry, on agriculture, on so many things is coded in an interoperable way so that you're not relying on a data depository per se, you're, you're, you're encouraging everybody to code in the same way and make those data sets interoperable on top of each other, GIS based, so we can find out what's going on. Um, the White House, uh, per that slide back there, uh, is talking about it. And on July 26th, in connection with a methane meeting in the White House, they proclaimed that NASA and EPA are going to create a greenhouse gas um, information system of some kind where, and they, they said, it's going to have publicly available data sources. If that data is, is not made in an interoperable way, it will be useless, I think. 
Um, so anyway, I'm going to close there. I talked too long. But nature, technology, work together. <laughs> talk among yourselves. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that you need a centralized, uh, a, a centralized function that can help create rules that all agencies need to be uh, hewing to. Uh, and I think that has to be driven out of the White House, actually. Um, and then, and then the agencies are going to are, are going to be have to have to uh, implement that. Um, so, but I, I think the the idea of a like a USDA having all of the important agriculture or forestry data in house mm -hmm. is is a bad idea. Is they're never going to be the tip of the spear in terms of what's happening. Uh, you know, in terms of new capabilities for better data, and um, so I don't know. This is an area where. A lot of work needs to be done, and you guys can help do this. Uh, uh, so anyway, good question. Yeah, I have a very similar question, but maybe I can ask it slightly different Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, you know, all of the above is needed in a way. So, like offshore wind has been, you know, on this track. And when I was at the Department of the Interior, we set up these uh, wind energy areas uh, because we learned as when we, when President Obama came in, he wanted to really gear up for renewable energy, and there were tons of of applications in the Southwest for solar farms. There were none had been acted on. There was no plan. We realized pretty early that you need a landscape level approach here to be smart about where you're going to site areas. And we actually early on did that because I also, we inherited the Cape Wind Project, which is a stupid place to have a wind farm <laughs> in Nantucket Sound. Uh, so, so that created these wind energy areas. And now the, what, the, what the White House is doing and what we were, I was doing when I was there is is bringing together the nature and the uh, uh, you know and the permitting agencies, so NOAA and Department of Interior and the and the developers and and all of this. And actually, one side benefit of all the permitting discussions that that's happening here is people are being educated about the fact that um, that that in a big project there are a lot of players. And if you don't have them all at the table in the front end, it's a disaster. And, and actually, uh, NEPA, uh, longer topic, but is a very good organizing principle for getting everyone to the table, also identifying what the environmental issues are up front. So you're not going to be surprised later. You're going to have an EIS that is good. And if there's a fatal flaw, you know, give the developer a chance to respond to it before you start a two or four year process. And that's been working. That's working great, actually. I, again, I'm. Uh, on, on the land side. And I think it's working pretty well, actually, on offshore wind, too. Those, those, things, those very complicated billion-dollar projects are moving right through a permitting system um, where everyone's getting their say. And, and so I, I'm, I'm a, a, you know, and transmission is a big problem. I, I, you know, I we, we rem remember a meeting where Ken Salazar and I were over with Steve Chu uh, and, and Tom Vilsack and others, and the question was, you know, these transmission, like, we need a grid or whatever, and uh, we need one authority to do all this permitting. And 
I mean, uh, the reality to me is that if you don't have the on the ground federal people like for the public lands folks that have, have responsibility and can help get that to happen, you're not going to have a good result. Uh, so so the, it's an interesting question about whether FERC should have complete permitting responsibility like they do for oil and gas pipelines for transmission lines. I'm not sure. Um, but there clearly has to be a way to put these things together, put these authorities and these resources and these experiences together. Well, we've got a lot of nature also outside the tropics, actually. Uh, the, the world's largest temperate rainforest is the Tongass National Rainforest in Alaska. Um, but I know you're, that's not the point, and I'm not trying to be snarky. Uh, um, I, I think it's a problem. I think you're, you're talking about what, what's a real problem, which is uh, getting resources to the global south on these issues. And I, 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 I think it's. It's more money than technology, <laughs> to be honest. Do you want to speak to that, Jesse? Well, I was just going to raise a question. I mean, we, we've funded most of that kind of work today in the National Climate Solutions through an offsets type framework, right? So the money comes from people who are paying yes. for the permission to continue doing what they're doing, right? Not change anything, and and that raises the measurement and verification uncertainties around the, you know the lack of technology and understanding of what's actually happening in these National Climate Solutions because you know we know there's a ton of CO2 going into the atmosphere. Know that that's basically permanent, yeah. Right? You know, in terms of the, the scale of uh, residency times for, for CO two, we have no idea what's happening, <laughs> right? It's huge error bars on what's happening on the offset side, and and that you know raises the stakes enormously. If instead it was treated as a not as a substitute for that removal, but as a public good, yes, somehow funded as a public good, right? Then the measurement wouldn't. I mean, it'd be important because we want to make the best use of the public I agree. dollar, but it wouldn't be offsetting. It wouldn't be substituting right. for measured and you know right. No, I, I agree. I, I think the, the tropical forest situation is more of a jurisdictional level problem to be solved. Than, and, and the MRV stuff is, I agree on 100%, is, is not, it's certainly not as relevant in terms of avoided deforestation. Um, so, uh, we know that's a good thing. Do we need to know exactly how much it is? Well, you do if you're trying to use it. Yeah, as that's right. If you're just trying to well, uh, and, 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 or, or, and or if, if you are. Um, you know, you have an investment strategy that is focused on some climate smart forestry practices, climate smart agricultural practices, and you want to return on that. Yeah. You got to have a baseline. You got to know what what's being produced. But that's not what's happening in the global south with forests. It's all about uh, deforestation at this point. Last question. I have one just sort of shifting gears, um, thinking about resilience a little bit more. I know. Extreme heat, given the summer we just had, is a really tricky extreme event because it doesn't fall under FEMA's jurisdiction the same way that other right. kinds of disasters do. The funding and bill was very limited for extreme heat. Yep. I'm interested in what you think the federal government should be doing given those kinds of constraints. Well, so Michael and I were talking about this beforehand. Um, the uh, for the, all of these major impacts, there's got to be a much more robust interagency effort where, because uh, the agencies are not designed, their mission areas are not designed for extreme heat versus flood versus wildfires, et cetera. Um, and on extreme heat, uh, there's an interagency working group that's co-led by EPA, NOAA, and the Department of Health and Human Services. HHS has a huge role to play here. They have not been able to get funding for the Office of uh, Climate Change and Health Equity that was in President Biden's executive order, 14,008, issued January 27. Uh, they're doing their best, but it's a, it's a huge problem. 
And uh, a lot of the problem is, as Michael and I were talking about, uh, is, a, is a federalism problem. You know, the, the, it, on the ground, it's, it's the communities that are trying to deal with this situation. Um, and, uh, and everyone's a little bit different. Everyone's got different capabilities. And then they don't know who to call in Washington. And, and, and the people in Washington don't know what to say. <laughs> so this is not good. Uh, <laughs> But, but they're working on it, and, and uh, there, there's, a, there's like now a drumbeat of fact sheets out of the White House like every three months on extreme heat. And you can see, I mean, the Labor Department's working on it. You know, HHS is working on it. NOAA's working on it. Um, but it's a systemic problem uh, that we don't know how to, we're not, we're not organized in a way that can effectively prepare for the events that are now big and often, and in areas that are, uh, are, um, uh, are not traditionally funded at the federal level. Um, good news is there's a lot of attention on it. There's a lot of money being shoved for drought resilience, for wildfire resilience, et cetera, coastal resilience. Uh, and, uh, but there, there's some areas where, uh, and, and you know, like, like extreme heat, it's like there's still orphans. Well, on that note, which is semi-optimistic, <laughs> semi-optimistic, let's thank David again. Thank you. Thank you.